الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنة رب الدين I'll praise you to Allah and your last peace and blessings the young black prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day the topic for this morning is the price of paradise It is a topic which is worth reflecting on because all of the various religions claim to offer their followers paradise. As Allah said in the Quran, وَقَالُوا لَا يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا تلك أمانيهم كل هاتوا برهانكم إن كنتم صادقين and they will say none will enter paradise unless he be a Jew or a Christian these are their own wishes say produce your proof if you are truthful then Allah goes on to say yes but whoever submits himself to Allah while doing good will have his reward with his Lord. They will not be overcome by fear nor grief. The Jews say that the Christians are not following anything. And the Christians say that the Jews are not following anything. Yet they both read the same scripture. The ignorant people say something similar to what they say. That is, the ignorant amongst Muslims they say something similar to what they say that no one will enter paradise except if he is a Muslim Allah will judge between them on the day of resurrection about that in which they differ to claim that paradise is the sole property of any particular group of people is incorrect to what Allah is correcting here the true followers of Prophet Moses would inherit paradise the true followers of Prophet Jesus would also inherit paradise as the true prophet followers of Prophet Muhammad may God's peace and blessing be on all of them would enter paradise the true followers why we stress that because to be a Jew is not necessarily to be a true follower of Prophet Moses Jew is now a race it becomes like a race to indicate a particular tribe of people and Jews will include in that tribe anyone whose mother was Jewish this is the condition if the father was Jewish and the mother was not then the child is not Jewish but if the mother was Jewish and the father was not the child is considered Jewish see? this is they trace their line to the mothers and they will include people like for example Einstein Einstein, the discoverer of the theory of relativity, who split the atom, etc., he is included as a Jew. Though he did not follow Judaism. You see, they will include anyone as long as that bloodline is established, regardless of what their beliefs are, they will be included as the, among the Jews. And they have changed the scriptures, their scriptures. Not so much the Torah, but their commentaries on the Torah in what is known as the Talmud. They have changed their scriptures, writing in there, that as long as somebody is a Jew, then paradise is there. This world was created for the Jews. Everything in it belongs to them. They have the right to take it, 
any way that they can. They can cheat and steal from others, but they shouldn't do so among themselves. This is right. They have changed scripture too. Even in the Torah today, you will find that they have changed concerning riba, interest. They have changed it where it states now that interest is forbidden amongst your brethren. But for a Jew to take interest from another Jew, it's forbidden. But it is permissible among the non Jews. Because, as I said, in, according to those false writings of theirs, they believe that this world was created for them. Similarly, Christians claim that paradise is theirs. Christians will be very eager to point out to Muslims that they are certain of paradise. The fact that they have accepted Jesus as God, as their Lord and personal Savior, that for them guarantees their paradise. This is their illusion. A delusion. Why? Because when you look amongst the Christians, you have so many sects of Christians, you can't keep track. How many they are, God only knows. And each one of them is saying, it's only, we are all the only true Christians. All the others are not true Christians. So which one is it that's going to paradise? <laughs> confusion. For the average Christian to know which one is right, it's confusion. They cannot determine. So usually people will just go according to emotion. If they go to a, a prayer meeting and they get the spirit, <coughs> they feel some kind of, you know, uh, sense emotional death. Okay, that's enough for them. The spirit. <laughs> They're guided by the spirit. God only knows what spirit it is. Is it really the spirit of God? You know, or is it uh, some other evil spirit? <laughs> but anyway, according to the spirit, they will go. Because they have no means of judging anymore. You know, they cannot use intelligence to judge. Because all of them are using the same scriptures and all of them have a whole set of claims. <coughs> so, Allah here tells them to bring their proof. They claim that paradise is theirs, then bring the proof. What is the proof that paradise is theirs? The scripture itself doesn't say so. The scripture itself, even in its distorted form today, it doesn't say anywhere in the Old Testament that paradise is guaranteed for the Jews. Nor can you find in the Gospels today, in spite of the distortion, and we know there are many distortions which have taken place in the Gospel, you will not find anywhere where Jesus said, that paradise is guaranteed for Christians. We're not funny. In fact, Jesus never even used the word Christian. This is a word coined by Paul after his time. So you'll not find in the scripture where Jesus guarantees paradise for Christians. Now, when Allah speaks about this in the Quran, he is not speaking about it merely to put down the belief of Christians and Jews, but to inform Muslims that they should be wary of falling into the same trap. Where Muslim today becomes a tribe a tribe. For example, I was recently in Singapore. I spent seven days lecturing in Singapore. Alhamdulillah, Islam is very much alive there, very active. A lot of Muslims are very much you know, involved in activities on the campuses. You know. Despite the constraints that the country has about propagating religion. However, in Singapore, Muslim means Malay. When a person becomes a Muslim, you know, they're Chinese, the majority are Chinese. If a person Chinese becomes Muslim, the people say he becomes or she becomes a Malay. You know, a Malay meaning from 
the, the Malay people, right? It's the tribe of people of Malaysia and Malaysia. Indonesia, they call Malay. So, the, so becoming a Muslim means to become a Malay. Okay, because in the mind, and this is in the minds of the people, that Muslim and Malay are synonymous. synonymous. You see? So Muslim becomes more like a tribe than it is really a religion. Similarly, in Bosnia, what happened in Bosnia where the Serbs, the Croats, started to kill Muslims, there in Bosnia, this was the only country where actually, you know, people have their, on their identity cards, the three groups of people that make up the former Yugoslavia, the three groups, one group will have their, their, their uh, race or their nationality, you know, as Serb, the other one has Croat, and the third one has Muslim. So the Muslims of Bosnia, this Muslim living on their card was their identity, their tribal identity. But if you looked at them in their daily life, they were no different from the Croats and the Serbs. They were doing the same thing. There was nothing that you could say was recognizable of Islam amongst them. So it wasn't until the Serbs, you know, and with the Quran started to kill Muslims simply because they are Muslims, that the Muslims now start to question, what it is to be a Muslim? Why are you were killing us? You know, our daughters are married to your, to, to your brothers and your, and your sons and all of a sudden you're killing us simply because we have Muslim on our heart. So this caused them to start to find out what it is to be Muslim. And Islam started to spread from that again. Because it had lost its identity, its meaning. And this is it wherever you go around the world. You know, uh, this is something in America, for example, in South America, in Guyana, in Trinidad, where there is a percentage of about 10 to 12 percent of the population of these two countries are Muslims. But they are Muslims who were brought there by the British from India. So in those countries, <coughs> Muslim means Indian. That's what it means. To be a Muslim is to be an Indian. And there are Hindus who are Indians too. They are, of course, Indians are Hindus too. But for the local population, they can't see any difference between the Muslim and the Hindus in terms of their lifestyle, how they live together and everything. So the Hindus will marry their children to, to Muslims, Muslims will marry their children to Hindus and it doesn't mean anything. So Muslim lost its identity. It just became Indian. And as I said, it is something, you know, throughout the world. I mean, in the Philippines, to become a Muslim also is to become what they will call immoral. Mm -hmm. So a Muslim is to become a moral. A tribal identity. But the fact of the matter, though these various peoples all consider themselves to be Muslims from a tribal point of view, and as such, they believe that paradise will be theirs, they have fallen into the same trap as the Christians and the Jews. Because that tribal identity is no passage to paradise. It is not a passage to paradise. <coughs> and as Allah said, the ignorant people said something similar to what they said. The ignorant peoples of the past as well as the people after them. The ignorant people who really have no knowledge, no revelation to guide them. Not ignorant in the sense that they don't have uh, knowledge of things of the world or you know technology or whatever. No. Ignorant is very intelligent in this area. But in terms of revelation, the guidance of revelation, they are ignorant. <laughs> And this is what has led them to make such statements. Allah says, Bala, 
من اسلم وجهه لله وهو محسن فله اجره عند ربه ولا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون yes but whoever submits himself to Allah while doing good will have his reward with his Lord and they will not be overcome by fear nor grief that is <coughs> paradise will be there because we know in this life we suffer from fear and grief every human being throughout his life suffers fear and grief so when Allah says that they will not suffer from fear and grief, it means in paradise. Because this is where suffering, suffering ends. But who are those? It's, a, it's those who submit themselves to Allah while doing good. Not merely those who claim to submit themselves to God. But those who truly submit themselves to God while doing good. These righteous deeds have to be connected to that faith. These are the conditions. In another verse in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, verse 111, Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهُ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ Indeed, Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and wealth for the price that paradise will be theirs. Indeed, Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and wealth for the price that paradise will be theirs. This is the price of paradise. Allah states it very clearly in the scripture. Paradise is earned when the believer sells himself, sells his soul or her soul, and their wealth, their property, to Allah. What is it? How does the believer sell their souls to Allah? It's very important for us to understand how. Because Allah says that those who do this are promised paradise. So it means it's very important for us to know this. It's a very important verse that we need to reflect on. And use it to gauge ourselves as to whether we are on a path to paradise or on a path to hell. Have we sold our souls to God? To sell the soul to God is to do whatever God has commanded us. Our soul represents our will. We express our soul through our will, what we choose to do. We choose between good and evil. Whenever we are choosing, this is the expression of our soul. When our choice is in accordance with the commandments of God, then we have sold our souls to Allah. Whenever we are faced with a situation where our desires, our love, our fear invites us to do what is not pleasing to God and we reject that and instead choose to do what is pleasing to God, then we have sold our souls to Allah. And this is submission. This is submission which Islam 
fundamentally means. Islam means submitting to the will of God. Submitting to the will meaning submitting to the commandments of God. Because God's will, what God wants for us, is according to His commandments. And this is something which Jesus emphasized even in the scriptures in their distorted form. You can find in Matthew 7 verse 21, Jesus is quoted as saying, None of those who call me Lord will enter the kingdom of God, enter paradise, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Who does the will of my Father in heaven. Also in Matthew 19, 16 and 17, Now behold, one came and said to him, said to Jesus, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he, Jesus, said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God, that is perfectly good. Of course, only human beings can have good. They can be good, but not perfectly good. Perfect good belongs only to God, to Jesus. Clarifying on this person. But if you want to enter into life, what is this life? Life eternal, paradise. Keep the commandments. This is the will of God, the commandments. Same principle. This is the religion not only of Jesus. He called his people to submit, followers to submit to the will of God. This was the religion which God gave Adam. When Adam came to this world, Adam and Eve, what was their religion? But to submit to the will, the commandment of God. What was Adam tested of in paradise? When God told him not to eat of the tree, what, what was the point? <coughs> this was the commandment. Was he going to obey the commandment of God? In other words, submit his will to the will of God? Or would he and his wife Eve follow their desires and disobey God? That was the religion of God that was given to them. Submitting to the will. What was that tree? What was the tree that they were told not to eat from? The tree of knowledge? They ate the tree of knowledge. What was the tree? What was that tree? Some say it was the apple tree. Some say it was sex. Some people say a lot of different things. But God did not reveal to us what was the truth. So it is all speculation. No one knows. No one has the authority to say what that tree was. No one has the authority. Why? Why didn't God tell us what the tree was? Because it wasn't important to know what the tree was. This is the point. If it were important for us to know what the tree was, because there are many trees like it in this life here that we need to avoid, then God would have told us what the tree was. But He didn't. It is not mentioned. It is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It is not mentioned in the Quran. What was the tree? So this is to let us know fundamentally. It is not important what the tree was. The point is that God told them not to eat of the tree. And it was for them to accept and to believe that whatever God has forbidden is harmful. That is enough. God, the all-wise, the all-knowing, who created man and created the world in which he lives, God knows what is harmful to man and what is not. If it were left up to human beings to choose, there are many things which are harmful to them which they would take. Some things which are harmful they would avoid. 
But there are many things which are harmful which they would take because of their desires. So God has defined for them the principles of avoiding things which are harmful to them through the commandments. Commandments received by Moses, commandments received by the God. Define for human beings what is harmful. It is not essential that the human being understands why and how it is harmful. If they believe in God, not just say they know God, because many people say they know God. They say they believe, God, believe in God, but maybe they only know God. They know about God. They have knowledge of God. But if they believe in God, then it means that that knowledge must be translated into action. How is it translated into action? Then if God tells them, do not do this, they will avoid doing it. If He tells them to do this, they will try their best to do it. This is belief. Knowledge which has been translated into action. So the religion of Adam was that of submission to the commandments of God, to the will of God. That's what it is. It didn't have any name in the sense of Judaism named after a people. No one didn't have a name like Christianity named after Christ in the Bible. But it was submission. And in Arabic, the word submission to the will of God is in Arabic Islam. Islam is not the name of a person or place or people, but the principle, the principle of the religion of God. Submission to the commandments of God. And this is the trade which the believer has to enter into with God. If he or she is a true believer, then they must enter into this trade. A commitment of their souls to God. And their wealth. Allah didn't stop with the soul. Allah purchases from the believers their souls and their wealth, their property. Means that for the believer, he or she has to look at this world and the properties of this world not as their own. Because we come into this world with nothing. We come into this world with nothing. And we leave this world with nothing. Whatever we accumulate during the period of time that we are here, it is temporary. When we die, somebody else takes it and carries on with it. When they die, somebody else takes it and carries on with it. So it's only shifting from hands to hands. Where does it come from? Did man create it? No. It is a gift from God. This is the greatness of God. The mercy of God. Then He gives us a gift and then rewards us with paradise when we use it according to His will. He gave it to us and we give it back to Him and he gives us time. This is a trade which doesn't exist in this world. This trade, this kind of trade doesn't exist in this world. <clears throat> Nobody will give you a car and then buy it back from you and give you money for it. <laughs> no business would succeed. Somebody gives you a house, then buys the house back from you and gives you the money for that. But this is the trade that Allah has offered. He gives us whatever property and wealth that we have in this life. And if we give it back to Him, giving it back to Him means what? That we use it according to His command. 
But we don't squander it. We don't waste it. Squandering and wasting comes in many different forms. For example, among women, it may be buying shoes. A woman can only wear so many pairs of shoes in a day. But I mean the Marcus left for us a warehouse of shoes. This is, this, is a, this, is a, this is the big expression of the squandering. Squandering of what? Shoes which she couldn't wear. No matter how many years she tried to change every pair of shoes, every day she couldn't wear all the shoes. And on a small scale, because of course squandering, <coughs> squandering will vary from person to person. Because a person. Is the point. What is the point of having ten pairs of shoes? Buying a new pair of shoes every year, or every six months, or every three months, or for every party or gathering or whatever. It's a squandering. The squandering analysis. For men, the squandering may come in the form of smoking. If you are smoking, it is haram from the point of view of it being suicide, killing oneself. But it is also haram from the point of view of it being squandered. Squandering of wealth. Because the money that people spend on cigarettes, it's squandered wealth. They're just burning up this wealth. Forbidden. And this is Consuming wealth as if it were our own to do with as we wish. So this is the capitalist view of wealth. Wealth is the property of the individual to do with as he or she wishes. This is why you will find in America and in England somebody dies and they leave all their wealth to a cat or a dog. They have relatives, children and others, but they're leaving it all to their favorite dog. And the countries will respect this. They will respect this. This is, this is a squandering. This is a, an attitude towards wealth wherein one feels that the wealth is their own to do with as they please. They have denied God. They may say I believe in God, but what they're doing is a denial of God that they have a responsibility to use that wealth in a way which is pleasing to God. Meaning that they use it without being excessive in their use of it, spending on themselves. And also in recognizing the rights of the needy in that wealth. That there are people who have needs and they have a responsibility to be charitable be generous and to share that wealth with others. In this way, when the believer recognizes that the wealth belongs fundamentally to Allah, and then uses that wealth in accordance with the commandment of God, then the believer has sold his or her wealth and property to God. And God has promised from that trade paradise. So the price of paradise fundamentally is submitting to the will of God in our hearts and souls as well as in our properties. Because that's what comprises the human being. The human being is the soul spiritual being and a material being, a being that has possessions around it. Whether it be the physical body and what we put on the body, what we live in, what we drive in, what we it's all extensions of the physical possessions. We are 
spirit and possession. So Allah is telling us here that these must all submit to the world. We must use it in a way in which He submits to the world, the commandment of God. And He advises us in a particular supplication from the Quran in which He said, Qul inna salat wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mati billahi rabbil alamin. Say, the believers said, say, indeed, my prayer, my sacrifice, my living and my dying is for Allah, the Lord of all the world. This is the prayer of the true believer. The prayer is or her connection with God. This is the spiritual commitment to establish prayer and their life. The sacrifice, this is the property. Sacrifice of the wealth, the property that they have. The living and the dying, that is the total life, should be for Allah. When a person commits themselves in that fashion, then whatever action that they do of the commandments of God, these become further uh, support for their way to paradise. This is why you find uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu saying that if they, any Muslim, this is a tradition in Sahih Muslim, concerning wudu, concerning ablutions, washing oneself before prayer, right, which was the practice of the Jesus the practice of all of the prophets, ablution. If any Muslim makes wudu, makes ablution, well, then stands and prays two units of prayer from his heart and body, paradise would be guaranteed for him. See, when we read that statement and we don't reflect on all what I've said before, then it seems amazing. How? You make you do and make two units of prayer and paradise is guaranteed. But you see, the Prophet Muhammad may God peace and mercy upon him said, they made wudu well. It means that wudu, the ablution, made properly. Properly meaning not just in the outer form, but with the correct spiritual frame of being. That one understands what one is doing, that it is a means of purifying oneself, preparing oneself for worship. So much so that the act of ablution becomes an act of worship. This is why we are instructed to take the name of God before beginning ablution. And to further supplicate when completing the ablution. And he prays, or she prays, two units of prayer from their heart and body. And not just the body. <clears throat> we know well the tradition where a man came into the mosque and the prophet was sitting with his companions. And he, when coming into the mosque, then made two units of prayer before coming into the mosque. When he came and sat down, the Prophet told him to go back and pray because he didn't pray. And the man returned and the Prophet sent him back. The man returned and he was doing it again, the Prophet sent him back. So finally the man asked him, what should I do? And he explained to him how the prayer should be performed. The man was praying as if he were in a race. Obviously his mind, his soul was not there. It was just a physical action. He went into it very quickly. So the Prophet slowed him down, showed him, demonstrated for him how the prayer should be. So, a proper prayer, a prayer of the Prophet, involving bowing and prostration, with 
not only the body, but with the soul. The frustration is a very intimate act that the believer does before his or her Lord. When we stand in prayer, <coughs> we stand before God with the fullness of our heart that we are standing before the Creator of the world. We're standing for Him alone. This is why in Islam actually it is forbidden for us to stand for anyone. When the judge comes into the court, I don't know if this happens in the Philippines, but in America, when the judge comes in, everybody is instructed to stand up. All right. For the honor of so Everybody has to stand up. And if you don't stand up, you may be charged with contempt of court, put in jail, or kicked out. But as a Muslim, we are forbidden to stand up for anyone but God. Furthermore, in our prayer we bow. Again, the kings, the powerful people, when their subjects come before them, they bow. Again, for Muslims, this is a reminder in our prayer that we only bow to God. And for those rulers, etc., who have reached the point where they are regarded by their subjects as God, <coughs> the pharaohs, the kings of Persia and Rome were the, were the people which guarded their rulers of God, then people were obliged to prostrate before them, put their heads on the ground before the rulers. And we do that only to God. Why our prayer has all these parts to it. Because these are the acts in this world that demonstrate or show the man's submission to other men. We stand for other men, we bow and we prostrate for other men. This is a submission of our world and ourselves to them. So this is incorporated in the prayer to remind the believer that this belongs only to God. We should not submit our wills to any human being, only to a person who prepares for prayer with this kind of ablution, this kind of prayer, then, as the prophet said, is guaranteed paradise. And he instructed his companions to inform the masses of the people that no one will enter paradise but true believers. This is the Islamic Only the true believers will enter paradise. Not people who necessarily say we are Muslims, they have cards or passports or whatever saying they are Muslims, but only the true believers. Whether they be followers of Prophet Jesus or Prophet Moses or Prophet Abraham or Prophet Muhammad, <coughs> may God's peace and blessings be on all of The true believers are the only ones who will enter into paradise. So, in summing up, the price of paradise is to sell our souls and our properties to God, meaning that we submit our will to God, which means that we obey the commandments of God with regards to our choices as well as with regards to the use of our wealth.